So, uh, welcome to our second class of ethics and critical thinking. The just schedule wise, we are now running straight through every Friday until Thanksgiving. So if at any point you need to reach out to me and you're not going to make class, just let me know. Um, these classes will be recorded and posted to the class uh, YouTube, which is posted on the link to it's on the blackboard. So if you ever miss class or your internet cuts out or anything, you will have full access to it on the blackboard. So um, today is going to really focus on, we said last class that this is the focus ethics and in formation technology. So just as a review, since it's been a two weeks, what did we say information technology was, or what are some examples of information technology? Computers, yeah, everything computer related, electric cars, any sort of modern data, um, digital technology is what we mean in uh, information technology. So computer software, anything like that is gonna be information technology. Now, just as a matter of um, description, most of the time I'm not gonna to refer to this class as ethics and information technology because that's just too many syllables. I'm usually just gonna call this class cyber ethics, where cyber is another way of referring to information technology. So usually if I send an email to everyone, it's gonna say cyber ethics information. Just be aware of that. All right, so most of the class, we're gonna be talking about the intersection of computers and ethics. But this class is gonna be our first class of the semester, which we really get into the meat of the theory. So we're really just gonna be looking at the ethics part. The idea is we're gonna talk about ethics in general for this class. And then the rest of the semester, we'll be applying what we discussed today. And this is really a primer or an intro to how to do ethics, what ethics is, why we care about ethics, so that when we get to real ethical questions around computers and computer technology, we have some background to refer back to. So we're all familiar with what we're talking about, and we've got almost like a toolkit for dealing with those things. So today we're gonna to put computers and everything in the background. We're not gonna be discussing any particular computer issues. Um, they'll come up a little bit, but we're mostly just gonna be focusing on ethics and what ethics is and how you go about it in general. Um, so anyone remember from last time how we defined ethics? Anyone remember what the definition was of ethics? So it's tied in with morality, and morality is tied in with what's good, bad. Um, so yeah, morality is M-O-R-A-L-I. There we go. But ethics, we said, is the, yeah, don't worry, Edgar, as I said a few last class, I don't give a damn about spelling. I know what you mean here, so whatever. So, but ethics is specifically, so think of it this way, biology studies what? Or what is biology? Biology is the study of life. What is chemistry? And this is not an ethics related question. It's just generally speaking, what is chemistry? Or what is mathematics? What do they study? Well, they're an entire field devoted towards, <laughs> towards studying things like chemicals. Ethics is the field in which you study morality. So what ethics is, is an entire field within philosophy in which you ask yourself, what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong? So to understand though, what the study of morality is, we need to discuss a little more what morality is and how you go about studying it and why we care about it as a thing. So here's the, Here's the notion that we're gonna be discussing mainly, morality. So we've already said morality has to do with doing the good thing versus bad, doing the good thing versus the bad thing or right versus wrong. 
so what did we say last time were some examples of moral issues or things that we study when we're studying morality? And these can just be examples you come up with of any sort of moral question you face personally or you've read about or anything like that. Unplugging someone in a coma. That's a really good one, Scott. That's a classic moral question is, and what is the question that comes up in this case? It's should I unplug this person? Should I take them off life support or should I allow them to continue in a coma? What are some other examples of moral questions here? Think of your own life. I'm sure you've had issues in your own times dealing with more moral issues. Just think of a time in which you had a difficult decision to make and what your difficult decision was. So a lot of times there are things that you might think of as moral questions. I'll give some other ones and then we can see if I can jog your brain. So other examples are things like um, death penalty. Lying about age to get vaccine early. Lying to mom not to get in trouble. All of these are things that we typically think of as moral. Another thing is um, choosing one person over another. So here's a case if uh, in like a, a very difficult decision, imagine you're on a boat. This is a famous case called Sophie's Choice. Imagine you're on a boat with your two children and the boat sinks and you can only hold one of them. Which one do you save? That is a classic moral question. Keeping animals in a zoo, that's another good one. Is it right or wrong to keep animals in a zoo? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? These are all very nice, big moral questions. And what you'll see, blasphemy is one. Is it wrong to curse a higher power or not? Um, getting asked to do something on the same day by two different people. Yeah, that's a, a normal everyday one, Justin where it's sometimes difficult to decide if you've made promises to two people or how do you decide whose feelings are you gonna hurt more? And you'll see here that one of the big key words with morality is it has to do with what you should do or what is the right thing to do or what is a good thing to do. And this is really a key word, it's should. What should I do in this particular situation? Um, Jim says, you picked up money somewhere. What are you going to do with it? Another really good moral question. All of these are cases of common sense notions of moral questions. And they're all tied in with this notion of doing the good thing or doing the right thing. So the way the book defines morality is, let me just write down the definition. Screw it over here so I can write it better a system of rules for guiding human action and principles for evaluating those rules. So let's unpack this a little bit. So each of these cases, these examples we gave, are cases in which this notion of morality comes up. And there's a few key terms I want to highlight here. Rules is one, action is another, and then evaluating is the third. So when we think about morality, what we're talking about, and this is where the should comes in, because when you're talking about what you should do, um, it's very much tied in with this notion of things to do. So unlike other issues, morality is about human behaviors and human actions. 
it's not about math. So in math, there's a way of, um, you know, you add when this, when you have this number and you're told to add two to it, what answer should you get? Well, you should get the answer four. But this isn't a matter of a moral notion. This is like a thought thing. Morality has to do with actions, the things we do with our bodies, the way we interact with the world, not the way we think or the things we do in like our head when we're doing mental math. So this is one of the key notions of morality. It has to do with how you should behave. And it's not just how you should behave on a particular like occasion. It's a matter of having rules. So what are rules? What do we mean by rules? In one sense, it's a pretty straightforward thing. You all know what I mean by a rule. Classes have rules. Your parents had rules. But the idea with a rule is that what a rule is, is it something that tells you a general thing that applies in many different situations. So for instance, if your parents had a rule, um, what was a, a rule that your parents had when you were growing up or still have for you? Be home by midnight. And Justin, so that's a really good one. The rule be home by midnight. When did it apply? Did it apply on Mondays? Every day, exactly. Mondays, you had to be home by uh, every night. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, unless there was a specific occasion. Like I'm sure if it was somebody's birthday and you talked to your parents ahead of time, you'd be allowed to stay out a little bit later. But generally speaking, a rule is something that applies universally. And so rules are useful because they provide guidelines that apply to every single individual situation. So, and the reason we like rules is because with just a single rule, we can apply it to many different cases. You don't have to have a special thing. You don't have to decide every Monday, what time should I go home? Because you have this general rule of every single Monday, you know exactly what you have to do because every day of the week, you have to be home by a certain time. So in the same way, what morality is, is it's coming up with these rules about how you should and shouldn't behave that are meant to apply universally. And the reason why we have these rules is we generally think if there's a reason that you should be home by midnight on Monday, those same rule, the same considerations that lead to that rule, namely that if your parents are going to bed and they wanna know you're safe, are also gonna apply on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays, et cetera. So in the same way with morality, we think of morality as rules because morality tells you what you should do and you want, because it's coming from this idea of what's the right thing to do or what's the good thing to do, which we think of as being the same in most situations. If it's wrong to kill someone on a Monday, it's gonna be wrong to kill someone on a Tuesday. So morality is coming up with these general rules that we can then use in many different situations to find out what's right and wrong. Does that make sense to everyone? Just in a very broad sort of way of what we mean here by like a system of rules, it's a set of general principles to get, govern our behaviors. And also the other thing here is that we then evaluate our behaviors afterwards. So it's not just that we decide beforehand. So for instance, knowing that murder is wrong on the one hand, so that would be like a classic moral principle, don't murder. And so this rule allows us one, if you're in a situation in which, you know, somebody's threatening you and you want to kill them, but you know this rule, don't murder, then you're not gonna kill them. But also afterwards, what you can do is you can then think about, well, why is that a rule? What is the general idea or on a particular case in which somebody has come up with a rule that says it's okay to lie on certain occasions? Well, then you can think about why is that a rule? Why is that something that's acceptable? When is it okay to lie? Is the rule don't murder something that we should have in every single case? This is what it is to do ethics. And this is what morality is. So in ethics, you study what the particular rules are, where they come from, and then you evaluate whether a certain rule you've come up with is a good one or a bad one. Um, so for instance, if you ask the question, let's just do a case here. This is a rule that most of us generally have, don't murder. But we can evaluate this rule and ask, does this always, is this always a rule we should follow? Or are there some cases in which this is okay? So think about it. 
Can you think of a case in which murder is acceptable or at the very least not obviously wrong? Self-defense is one. If somebody tries to hurt you and you kill them in the process of defending yourself, maybe it's okay in that case, or at the very least, it's less bad than if you just walk up to someone on the street and stab them. What's another case in which murder is not necessarily a bad, like the wrong thing? Maybe there's a better option against a very dangerous target. So yeah, a, like a political assassination against a dictator, you might think is a case in which murdering that person or like a terrorist leader. Is it okay to murder a terrorist leader if in the process you're stopping them from carrying out a terrorist attack? So if, for instance, the United States, in honor of the 20th anniversary of 9-11, if the United States had had a chance to kill Osama bin Laden before he could carry out 9-11, maybe it would have been okay, maybe not. But this right here, asking these questions, this is what you do in ethics. You ask, what principles do I have? And how, why are those good rules to follow? And should I maybe reconsider the rules I have been following since I was a child? So does that all make sense? All right. So one other thing, though, that I want to focus on is these rules. Now, there are um, there was a Japanese student who killed a communist leader with a sword. Yeah, these are cases in which you can point to examples in time in which a lot of times someone who kills an opposition leader or a totalitarian leader, they're not called a murderer, they're called a hero. So for instance, um, somebody who killed a, a leader in a nation that um, had a government different than the one that they wanted. Or another case is somebody like, um, well, another case would be someone like uh, Martin Luther King, where he wasn't violent about it, but there were many people who thought that a Black man talking about freedom and getting rid of um, Jim Crow laws was in some sense, this was not his place. But to other people, this was a case. So from their view, it was like, this is a bad thing, people in the South at the time. But now we can look and see like, oh, civil disobedience, breaking the law is okay for this greater good. All of these are cases with ethics. But there's one thing I want to talk about with rules, which is that there are many rules that govern our behavior. So for instance, we have this rule um, of be home by midnight. Now, this is a rule that many of us have had in our lives. And it's a rule that governs our behavior. However, do we want to say that it is a moral rule? When you think in your common everyday sense of what's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. So don't murder. It feels like this is some very strong principle where if you break that rule, you've done something fundamentally flawed. But if you're supposed to be home by midnight and you're not, do we want to say that you've done something morally wrong in a common sense way? Or no, exactly. You want to say that there's something less bad. Like if, even if you have a curfew of midnight, not getting home by midnight is somehow less bad than murder or even lying or even breaking a promise. There's something more to it. So what this shows is that not every rule governing our behavior is a moral rule. There are actually many different rules that we follow in our everyday lives, and only some of them are moral rules. And it's not always easy to differentiate them, but it's worth taking the time to try just to get a better understanding of what the moral rules are. So I'm gonna write down right here, different types of rules that we have so that we can differentiate the moral ones from other ones. So what are some of the rules that you in your everyday life have to follow? We've got the moral ones. What are some other rules we've got? We've got like parent rules. What are some more rules that you have to follow in your everyday life that aren't necessarily moral ones? Well, just think. What are some things, some rules either written down, official, or not official that you don't have to follow? So habits. Habits is a good one. These aren't really rules that, um, these aren't really rules that are written down anywhere, but or that even anyone else cares about, but it's the way you do things. So for instance, I have a rule of like, well, 
We can have personal habits of like, I always have to put my left sock on before my right sock. That is not a moral rule. It's just a habit that I follow. Um, so that is one type of rule that's not a moral rule. Uh, Rebecca says driving rules. So what types of things are driving rules? There's a special word for them that, uh, that we have here. It's three letters. What are, what, where do the driving rules come from? They're laws. Exactly. Laws are another type of rule that we have. A bro code or the certain types of rules on things like subways. So I'm going to put bro code, subway behavior. So these aren't quite laws because they're not written down. The police aren't going to punish you for them. But they're also not moral laws. Like the person who is being annoyingly loud on the subway. We don't, we think of them as having somehow done something wrong or think about the tourist who's walking too slowly in New York. They're not doing anything against the law. They're not, it's not just a habit of theirs. And in some sense, we don't want to say that the tourist who's walking too slow is doing something completely morally wrong. It's rather, they're just breaking what we call norms. And norms are these unwritten rules that govern our society. We'll come back to this later in the semester. But norms are things like walk on the right side of the sidewalk or um, wait for everyone to get off the subway before you get on or bro code sorts of things where it's like there are certain things where like friends don't do these other things to friends, even if there's nothing like illegal about it or we don't want to necessarily say there's something deeply flawed in the sense of like murder. But there's still a sense in which there are these unwritten rules that we have. So does everyone under see, the, see these different types of rules? And you can see that they're not quite the same. So for instance, there can be laws that we want to say, even though the law says one thing, we want to say that what the law says goes against the sort of norms or bro code sorts of things. So can anyone ever think of an example in which like the unwritten rules of a society tell you to do one thing? And what it tells you to do is different from what the law says. How many of you have been peer pressured in your life? Yeah, this is also a test of are you awake right now? Because everyone at some point has been peer pressured. How many of you have been peer pressured into doing something, you don't have to say what it was, that was illegal? Yeah, a lot of us have. This is a case in which the laws, the rules that we are supposed to follow, the law ones, come apart from what these unwritten norms are. And very often, what we find is, and the same thing with morality and the law, there are many laws that we have that even if you technically break the law, we don't want to say you've done something wrong in the moral sense. So for instance, um, anyone who's ever driven a car has driven over the speed limit. That's a case in which driving over the speed limit is illegal, but it's not immoral. Like you, if somebody's driving five miles over the speed limit, I don't think they're a bad person. And my guess is you don't think so. And then another thing on the flip side, gaslighting. Gaslighting, um, does everyone know what gaslighting means? Anyone want to give a definition for it? Yeah, kind of. It's actually worth pausing for a second to just clear up exactly what it means because it comes up a lot now. And it's worth putting a, a... Yeah, so basically what it what gaslighting is, it's a, fo it's a form of... Uh, um, basically what it is, is you doubt what somebody else is saying or you... So it's very often a... a a case to, just to give a concrete example is in a relationship. If one partner consistently belittles or doubts what the other person says to such a degree that that other person has to begin to doubt it themselves. Um, so you manipulate a person by forcing them to question their own decisions. So it's not illegal to do that in most cases. In some cases, it is actually illegal. But in most cases, it's not technically illegal to do this to someone. So a case in which somebody says, I'm going to be going here, or like, this person's my friend, and the other partner 
doesn't like that person, so starts doing things to convince this person. So you got person A, and they're in a relationship with person B, and then there's this person who's person A's friend. If person B starts putting thoughts into person A's head to get them to stop being friends with this person, that's gaslighting and doubting everything they say and just rejecting it and ignoring it. That's gaslighting. Not illegal, but in some sense immoral. You're disrespecting a person. So the whole point of this is just to show that morality comes apart from other types of rules. And therefore, it's useful to just say what the defining characteristics are of the moral rules. What makes them different from other rules? I'm just going to put up norms here so I have a little more room. So the book, um, and this definition, like one thing that we're going to learn over and over again this semester is that definitions are very difficult. It's hard to come up with a perfect definition of something. Like even something you might think is basically outside of mathematics, it's very difficult to come up with a perfect definition. So even something like, um, what's something that you think you could give a clear definition of that's not mathematical? And then I'll show you that it's actually very difficult. So first off, do people know what I mean by definition? And in some sense, we all know what definition means, but strictly speaking, it's useful to think of a definition as a way of just you describe something that makes that every instance of that thing has and separates that type of thing from everything else. So if you give a definition of a triangle and you say it's a shape with three sides, what you're doing is saying, well, every triangle has three sides, and this is what separates triangles from all other things in the universe. So for instance, a dog doesn't count as a triangle because it doesn't have three sides. Um, your love life does not count as a triangle in the straightforward sense because it doesn't have three sides. If your love life does count as a triangle, then maybe it's because there's a third person involved and it's messy. But this is what we mean by definition. So it's difficult to give definitions a lot of the time, but the book wants to just, it's useful to try to give a definition of what makes moral rules different from other ones, just so we have a better understanding. Um, so I'm gonna write these down and then we're gonna, well, first off, let me pause. Are there any questions at this point about any of this stuff? If at any point this semester I'm confusing, uh, you step away and you miss something, you need me to repeat it, just let me know and I will do that. So, and again, because we're on Zoom, feel free to shout, like just turn on your microphone and shout at me if something's confusing. All right, so the four things that the book defines as what make moral rules different from other types of rules like habits, et cetera. Public informal, rational, and impartial. So what I want to do is just go through and explain what it is and how some of these rules are, um, and how we can like tie out these other rules, types of rules from moral ones on these bases. So for instance, let's start with public. What is it for something to be public? When you do something in public, what does that mean? Yeah, it's known by many. It's out there. It's part of everyone can see it and judge it. So that's the idea with morality. These aren't secret rules that nobody else knows. It's rather that we generally think of moral rules like don't murder as a rule that everyone is aware of and thinks of. So that's different from something like a habit, where if I have a rule that says, always put my left sock on before my right sock, well, in that particular case, that's not a rule that's public. It's a very private rule. So that's one thing that separates moral rules from um, things like habits or things like your rules from your parents are generally speaking, not everyone knows what those rules are. Not everyone talks about those rules. But things like morality, we generally think that everyone knows the general moral rules like don't lie, don't murder, don't steal, don't cause people pain. So that's the notion of public. And so a moral rule is public. 
Some of the other ones are as well. So like laws are public, they're written down for everyone to read. Within a society, generally, the, the norms are public. Like you know what you're supposed to do on a subway and what you're not supposed to do. So that's the first thing though. So public applies to some of them, but what, and what it means is these are rules that everybody knows or at least everyone should know. So does that make sense to everyone? The first one, public. Okay, informal. What is informal versus, well, what's the opposite of informal? Formal. So what is it when something is informal? So if you have to go somewhere and you're told informal attire, or if you're told that we will have, yeah, not really professional. That's a very good way of putting it. Or another way of putting it is it's just somehow like loose. There aren't strict written down rules. So what is something that is informal versus formal? Well, think about um, the rules of John Jay. The rules of John Jay about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do as a student. You can find out what these rules are and where can you find them out? There's the website, yeah. There was a code of conduct that you had to like read. And my guess is you probably had to sign it and you didn't read it and you didn't pay attention because who reads forms? But this is uh, the sense, these are formal things. An informal set of rules are ones that are not actually written down. So the law is very formal. It's not just written down. There's also a whole system in place for punishing you if you go against it. So if you break a legal law, if you do something illegal, then there's going to be a system in place to punish you for that. So by contrast, if you do something wrong, any punishment you have is going to be informal. So for instance, you, you aren't necessarily going to go before a judge if you lie to your grandmother. What's going to happen to you if you lie to your grandmother and you get caught? Yeah, you're going to get scolded. You're maybe, depending on your grandmother, she'll be disappointed. But yeah, it's just going to be these informal sorts of, she might judge you, she might try to make you feel bad, but she's not going to like put you in jail or anything like that. She doesn't have the power. So informal are these rules that are, even though they're public, there's no set of institutions in place for when you break them. So um, something is moral when it's both public out there, everyone knows what it is, but it's also not necessarily the case that it is, um, it's, it's not built into the society in a way in which there's institutions to punish you or reward you for these things. In the same way, um, if you do well on a test, you get a good grade. That is an institutional thing. If you hold a, a door for a little old lady who is struggling with her groceries, it's not like somebody comes down and gives you a gold star. It's rather that like doing the good thing is itself just the whole story. If you do something bad, then maybe somebody's going to judge you, but you're not going to necessarily be punished for it. So that's what informal means. Rational. What does rational mean? Have, how many of you have seen this word rational? Does anyone want to try to, um, yeah, being reasonable, um, it's tied in with reason. And so what rational means is basically uh, capable of higher thought. So something that is rational. So we can say humans are rational animals. And what that means is we're capable of complex thought. We're able to think things through in this logical sort of way. Um, and so what it means by morality is rational is it basically means two things. The rules of morality follow the basic laws of logic or the laws of truth and falsity. So for instance, just to give a clear case of a nice little um, rational argument or rational way of thinking. One, it's warm in here. Two, whenever it's warm, I sweat. Conclusion, I'm sweating. 
So this right here is what's called an argument. And what it is, is it's just the way in which two true things together lead to a third true thing, namely, I am sweating. The idea here is that these same exact rules, sorts of things, and you can just look at this and just know that like, oh yes, if this one is true and that one's true, this also has to be true. So the first thing to say morality is rational is um, if these same sorts of rules apply in, the, in moral cases. So it's wrong to murder when, um, John murdered someone. Conclusion, John did something wrong. So this, these same sorts of rules apply in the case of rationality. Unlike your habits, like your habits don't necessarily have to be rational in this way. Like you can have habits that make no sense whatsoever. They don't have to follow these rules. It could be that you only chew your fingernails on Tuesdays. And if you chew your fingernails on a Tuesday, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to chew them on every Tuesday. It's just kind of haphazard. The other thing that rationality means is that the moral rules generally are thought only to apply to creatures that are capable of higher level thought like this. So let's bring this out. Um, if I were to walk up to a little old lady and spit in her face, would I have done something wrong? Morally wrong, yes. Now, can anyone think of a human being who if they spit in an old lady's face hasn't done anything wrong? So that would be one case, would be a monkey. If a monkey does it, if the monkey committed a moral Flaw. Can we say this is a monkey that, you know, is going to go to monkey hell or a llama? That's another good one. In some sense, we don't want the llama to do this, but the monkey and the llama are not in some sense morally wrong because in monkeys, llamas, someone who's mentally unstable, I'm going to put mentally handicapped, or a child. If any of these things spit in someone's face, we don't think that they are doing something morally wrong. Why? Well, because what's the simple reason? They don't know any better. Exactly, Justin. And this is the idea is that with morality, in some sense, you have to know the rules and you know you're breaking the rules. And you have to be capable of recognizing that there are these moral rules. And any being that isn't capable of recognizing it isn't capable of doing like engaging in morality. So it's only the rational creatures. So another one, if like, if you kill someone, we call it murder. If a wolf or a bear kills someone, we say the bear killed someone, but we don't say the bear committed murder. It's a bear. It doesn't like, that's what it does. Or, you know, Jaws, in the movie Jaws, the shark kills people, but it's not like Jaws is wanted for murder. It's just this shark keeps killing people, so we have to get rid of it. If a person did the same thing, we'd say in some sense they're morally flawed. They've done something morally wrong. So that's what we mean by rational here. And very often norms, like what separates norms from uh, morality, is that it seems like even things that don't understand the rules, they should still follow them. So for instance, a tourist who doesn't know the rules of New York, we still in some sense think they're breaking them and doing something wrong. They're somehow like, you know, they're very annoying when they're walking on the, like slowly on the wrong side of the, the sidewalk. So norms apply even to babies. Like babies are supposed to share. You have to teach them because it's the same for everyone. A moral rule though, it only applies to the intelligent, rational things. Does that difference make sense? So when we're talking about moral rules, we think they're things that are applying. There are these public informal rules. You're not getting punished if you break them um, in like the sense of you have to go to like 
a judge, if you lie to your mom, you've done something morally wrong, you know you're not supposed to do it because you're a rational creature, but you don't, she might yell at you, but there's no like official tribunal where you go before a judge and have to get a jury and everything. And then the last one, um, well, first off, we everyone on board with the first three parts? Perfect. All right, the fourth one, impartial. Does anyone know what impartial means? So being neutral, or another way of putting that, unbiased. So yeah, an impartial rule is one that applies, yeah, not having favorites. So the idea with a moral rule is that it applies to everyone equally. It, or if it applies differently to different people, there's a reason for it. It's not just like pure randomness. So for instance, your parents can make up rules that apply differently to different kids for no good reason. They can just be like, well, this kid's my favorite, so they get a bigger allowance. That's just, you know, parents are allowed to do that. Um, with norms, you can have things like, you know, if you are a movie star, you get treated differently. If you are an everyday person, you know, nobody walks up to you and asks for your autograph. Like who you are makes a difference. However, with moral laws, we generally think of them as applying the same to everybody. So I'm not allowed to murder. You're not allowed to murder. Um, doesn't matter what your name is, who you are. There's no special people. Now, maybe you could say something like there are certain rules that, yeah, fair and equal is another way of putting it. Is impartial means fair and equal. So the rules have to be fair and the same for everybody. Or so you can think of particular cases in which certain types of people are allowed to do certain things. So for instance, there are certain things that we allow, um, like, you know, police officers are allowed to, well, actually, no, let's think about, uh, there are things that mothers are allowed to do for their children that we think other people are not allowed to do, morally speaking, like you, for a stranger aren't allowed to punch someone in the face if they get too close to you. But if it's a mother protecting their child, maybe we give them a little more um, leeway. But note that it's any mother. It's a general sort of thing. It's anyone who is a mother is allowed to do this. Or anyone, it's not like a particular person. Compare this with a case of a, if we had a society in which, you know, the, the leader is allowed to do whatever they want, but everyone below them is banned from say, you have like a very top down society where the, the um, leader is allowed to have, or in a cult, the leader is allowed to have many different wives and husbands, but everyone else is allowed to have one. That's a society that's not impartial. That's a society that's not fair and equal. Morality by contrast applies the same for everyone. If it's wrong for you to sleep with someone who isn't your spouse. It's wrong for them to sleep with someone who's not you. It's wrong for your neighbor to not sleep with someone, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we mean by impartial. So the moral law, something like murder, don't murder. We all know it's a rule. Um, there are laws around it, but uh, even in a society in which say, if the US government collapsed and it's the zombie apocalypse, it seems like it's still in some sense, even there, it would still be wrong to commit murder. It's rational because we don't think that the zombies who can't think are committing murder, they're just eating people's heads. And it applies the same for everybody. No matter who you are in the zombie apocalypse world, you're still supposed to not murder. Um, or at the very least, if you murder, you're doing something wrong in that society. Does all of this make sense to everyone? And this is what is meant to, to separate out the moral rules from other types of rules you follow. Things like politeness. You know, in some sense, if you, you're, if you meet someone new and don't shake their hand, you're doing something wrong, but not in a deeply moral sense. You're not a terrible person. And that's another thing about morality. The way you can think about it is if you break a moral rule, you can think, oh, that person is somehow being a bad person. If you break a norm, you're not really being a bad person, you're just not knowing. If you go against one of your habits, you're not a bad person. If you break the law, you're not necessarily a bad person. If you do something immoral and you know it, then there's some sense in which you have done something that reflects on your character as a human being.
All right, let me take a sip of water and pause here and just ask, are there any other questions? All right. So that's generally speaking what morality is and what moral rules are. Is so when you're doing ethics, what you're looking for is what are the right public, informal, rational, impartial rules to follow, either in a particular case or generally speaking across all cases. And so what I want to do now is look at how you actually go about trying to find what some of these actual rules are that we can use in our everyday lives. And the general idea with ethics is the way you do it is you think of some cases that are pretty straightforward and simple or that we have very strong judgments about. And then once you understand them, you attempt to apply or like take out of that particular case a more general public and formal rational rule that you can apply in new cases. So in this case, what we're gonna be talking about is what are some of the general ways you decide about what's the right thing to do in any given case? And then how might we apply that in new cases, including cases on the internet? So what I wanna do here is just talk about like a very classic ethical issue. Um, some of you will have heard of this and then look at how is it that we go about deciding and see if from our way of deciding, we can come up with a general principle for deciding how to go about our behavior that we can then use later on in the semester. Well, and then we're gonna look at some issues with that first principle we come up with, see if we can find another one that would fix those problems and then talk about how these two can be used together to try to figure out what's the right thing to do once we get to a case in which we have actual uh, computer issues in front of us. I'm speaking very generally here. It's going to make more sense once we jump into the details. So, um, how many of you have heard the trolley problem? Either because you watched uh, The Good Place or because you've taken a philosophy class or you just happen to have heard of it. Okay, so a few of you have heard of the trolley problem. So does anyone want to type out or say what the trolley problem is while I draw it up here, just for everyone else? And then I'll describe it afterwards. All right, so imagine this situation. Um, you can imagine a subway instead of a trolley, basically a trolley just like a train that runs on tracks. So imagine here's the situation. Right now, you happen to be walking along uh, a subway track and you notice that there are current, there's a train coming. And this train is going along and um, if you do nothing, you're standing here and you see these, there are five people standing on the tracks right now, five construction workers who have their headphones in are doing like manual labor and this train is coming. If you do nothing, this train is gonna keep going and run over five people. And then what happens when five people get run over? Five people die. But you notice there's a button or a switch right here. So does everyone know how like um, train tracks work where basically there's like switches where when there's a break in the tracks, you press a button and then what would happen is the track would move so that instead of going one way, it's now going the other way. So if you press this button, the train is now gonna change directions. And instead of running over five people, it's just gonna run over one person. You press a button and by pressing this button, instead of five people dying, one person's gonna die. So what's the question here? Well, the question as Tal says is, do you press the button or is the right thing to do 
to press the button and change the direction. Basically, if you press the button, one person dies. If you don't press the button, five people die. Should you press the button is the right thing to do to press the button. So let's just ask, how many of you think the right thing to do is to press the button? Raise your hand, type in the chat, whatever you want. We've got one so far, three, four, five, six. I'm in this camp too, I would press the button. So most of us feel like you should press the button. Is there anyone who would not press the button? Say not in the chat or raise your hand now. So there are a few of you, there are a couple who would not do so. So let's start with the people who said, yes, I would press the button. Why would you press the button? What is your reasoning for this? Less casualties, one to many, fewer casualties, less death. So here's this idea. One life over five lives. Yeah, this is one of the ways. So we have a particular case and most of us have strong feelings that what you do is press the button. So those of you who disagree, wait a second, we'll come back to you. But those of us who press the button, we have this idea that it is generally speaking the case to save more lives over few or more generally speaking, to cause less pain than to cause more pain. It is wrong to cause more pain and it is good to reduce the amount of potential pain in the world. So what we've done here is we've looked at a simple case and from that come up with a general rule that we can use in other situations. So here's the case, here's our rule. Um, the better, more, more morally right thing to do is the one that causes more, let's just say, less pain. This right here is a general, so what we've done here is just some basic ethics. We start with this situation. We think, what would we do in this case? Why would we do that? And then we come up with a general principle that can be applied in other cases. So what are some other cases that are similar to this one in which you decide like this is something to do and this is why it's the right thing to do because it's causing less overall pain. Can anyone think of a similar situation in which you'd apply the same exact rule and it seems to give you the exact same answer that yes the right thing to do is this one how many of you have um agreed to go to something with people and then afterwards you really didn't want to go but you knew you'd disappoint them if you didn't go. So you decide to go anyway. How, too many times, yeah. So the reason why, and why do you think you should do it? Well, let's just think about this case. In this case, you're thinking, well, it's gonna cause me some pain to go to this thing. I really don't wanna go. However, if I don't go, there's gonna be a lot more people who are disappointed. So this is a sort of, or your parents' expectations, that's another good one where you think like, oh, if I don't do this thing, like, yes, I really don't want to, but it's if I don't do it, it's gonna cause my parents much more pain than it's causing me. Or another case is one in which like, you decide to, how many of you have pulled a splinter out with like a needle or something? How many of you have gotten a splinter before? Yeah. And when you're pulling it out with a needle or you're like getting the tweezers in there, is that a pleasant experience? It hurts, but why are you doing it? Because in the long run, it's gonna be better. Or think about a parent who, um, you know, a better case would be a parent who pulls the tweezer, the, 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 um, the splinter out of their child. The child is crying, the child's unhappy, it is in pain. 
but in the long run, it's not going to get infected. So by you are doing the right thing to take care of your child in this way, because of the long run, there will be less pain. So this right here is one way of going about a moral question. And we can think about other cases just to give an example of, um, well, let's see. Can anyone think of a case in which this type of reasoning would apply in a information technology or cyber or computer related situation? Where is the case in which these sorts of, the same sort of principle could be used to guide our behavior online or programming or anything like that? I'm gonna give you guys a second to try to think of one and then I can throw. Selling information rather than not. So yeah, here's a case in which you might have someone's credit card information. Say, and you could sell this online and make a good amount of money. But we wanna say in some sense, what do you think? Is it, if you steal someone's credit card information and sell it online, or you happen across someone's credit card information and sell it online, is that morally wrong? Yeah, that's theft and it's wrong. Yeah, so all of you are on board here. And why? What is the reason for it? Well, the amount of pain that you're causing someone by stealing their credit card information is not offset by like, yes, you can maybe buy some more things online, but it's not screwing up. Or if you don't have this, your life isn't going to be screwed up. While somebody else, it might very well mess up their life if you steal their credit card information or you commit identity theft. Or another case is why is it wrong for somebody to, and we talked about this last time, what did I say ransomware was? <clears throat> yeah, locking someone's information up. Basically you, in, you hold people's data hostage, you encrypt their files until they pay you money. So why is it wrong to do this on a hospital? Well, because you're putting many people's lives at risk for your financial benefit. So this is a general moral principle that applies in many, many different situations. So one thing you can think here is the same sort of reasoning that gets used here, or to give a, like a very, very like close to this case, there is currently a major issue here of a, a, a train or a trolley is kind of like what? What are other things that move around in a certain way as a mode of transportation? There's trains, there's planes. What else have we got? Cars, exactly. Cars. What are people like Elon Musk and other uh, and Google trying to do with cars? Not just make them electric, but make them smart self-driving you have, there's an, a push to make self-driving cars and if you have a self-driving car what does the car have to do amongst other things well it needs to avoid hitting objects so for instance it's got to drive but there's going to be cases because all of us like regular drivers deal with this situation and self-driving cars are going to be in the same situation where imagine that a self-driving car is driving down the street and all of a sudden this self-driving car, a child-sized object moves into the middle of the road and the car doesn't have the ability to stop fast enough. You're gonna have to program this car of what to do in this situation. So if the car is coming along, so instead of this, we've got like an Elon Musk style self-driving car and instead of a button, you've got a person running in front of the road a small child size object. And so you're gonna to have to program the car what to do in this situation. Well, one of the things it's gonna to have to decide is, do I just keep going and hit this one object? Or do I try to swerve if there are rather five people over here on the sidewalk? And this is something you're gonna to have to, self-driving cars are going to have to be programmed to do. So this is a very practical case of no one's really sure how to program these self-driving cars, what to do in these situations. Or if there's five people in the road and one on the sidewalk, 
to program the car to go up on the sidewalk and actively hit that person to avoid killing five? What should you do? These are cases in which it looks like this general principle is going to come in handy. So does that make sense to everyone? How what we're doing here is you start with an ordinary clear situation. You then try to come up with this general principle about what to do in this case so that we can then use this in further situations and decide how to behave in those situations as well. <clears throat> So this type of moral theory or this type of principle is something that is called, this first one is called consequentialist because you're deciding what the right thing to do is based on the consequences. And this particular version where you decide what to do is causes, the, causes less pain slash more pleasure for the world as a whole, P-L-E-A-S-U-R-E, -E, is called utilitarianism. And I'm just giving you this term because it's something you might come across in your everyday lives, other classes. So what utilitarianism is, is a moral theory that the way you decide any particular moral question, be it self-driving cars, be it how you should behave on the internet, be it how you should interact with your grandmother, the way you decide what to do is you choose the uh, you choose the action that is going to cause the least pain and the most pleasure. So does this make sense about what this is? And we'll be talking back to consequentialism and utilitarianism. We'll be referring back to this throughout the semester. It's not going to be something. There's not going to be a test in which I demand that you memorize what this means. It's more just. This thinking about things in a utilitarian way is a useful way for deciding how to go about your life going forward. And we're going to be applying this to various ethical considerations tied in with cyber technology as the semester goes along. But this is the first way to decide how to do something. You look at the consequences of it. The right thing to do is the one with the best consequences. And in the case of utilitarianism, that means it's going to cause the least overall pain for the world as a whole and the most pleasure. So even if it's causing you personally a little bit of discomfort to go to something you don't want to go to, it's the right thing to do because it's going to bring high quality, uh, more pleasure to the world as a whole because you promised a whole bunch of friends and they're counting on you. Everyone on board with what this all means. Now, what I want to do now is talk about why ethics isn't simple. And what we're going to do is give a different version of the trolley problem where it seems much, much more difficult to come up with, uh, or at the very least, it seems like the answer we give pulls in the opposite direction from this first one. And what this is showing is that ethics can be very difficult because we have different kind of judgments and we take different things into consideration. And one of the reasons why it's so hard to do ethics is because we have these things pulling us in opposite directions. And one thing that this is going to come up is just if we think about these different sorts of complications and how we solve things in different types of situations, it will help us in new situations on the internet, where, which are similar to ones that have come before. And we can look at the ways in which our judgments have worked so that at the very least we're coming up with principled ways of making sure that we're behaving in good ways in situations we've never encountered before and ways in which we can consider the sorts of issues that come up in these new sorts of situations and what sorts of things we should and shouldn't care about um, when deciding on new cases. All right, so that's what utilitarianism consequentialism is. Now let's go with the second trolley problem. Same situation as the first in terms of there's five people on a train track. And there's a train coming. But now imagine that over the train track, there's just one track, there's no like break. Instead, there's a bridge over the train track. This is a terrible drawing, but just imagine that's a bridge over the train track. 
And on this bridge are two people. One of them is you. And one of them is somebody else standing in front of this train. And you look at this train and you see the driver of the train is passed out drunk. You look and you see they've got a bottle in their hand. They're not paying attention. And you see that this train is barreling towards these people. And you also know that all trains have these built-in automatic stop systems where if they hit something, they automatically break. So you look at this train coming and you know that if you do nothing, this train is gonna run over five people. How else, however, you also know that you are too far away to wave this guy down or anything. You know the only way to stop this train is to push this guy so he falls in front of it. The train will hit this person. When it does, the train will stop and not hit these five. How many of you think the right thing to do in this case is to push this person who just happens to be standing there next to you in front of the train to stop it in order to save these five people? How many of you think you should push this person? Is there anyone, any brave souls? How many of you think it's clear that you shouldn't push the person? How many of you think it's just like blatantly clear, do not push this person? So yeah, if you don't think you should push the person, type no or me or I wouldn't in the chat. So, okay, so in this case, it's much less clear. In this case, it seems to all of us, at the very least, even if it's the exact same numbers as the other case, it seems like it's a lot less obvious. So those of you who were in the last one were like, I wouldn't press the button. It should be even clearer in this case that you wouldn't push this person. Now, here's the question. What's different in this case? Go inside yourself and ask, why is, so um, what if you throw the person's shoe? Well, the person's shoe, it's gonna take them a while to get it untied and there's no other objects around. Plus the shoe's not heavy enough to trigger the train's brake system. It's push this person or not push this person. That's the only choice. Um, so what's different in this case? If you look, it's still five versus one, but somehow it feels different. Physically killing someone. So this is one. So it feels somehow different or physical or direct killing someone. What, what else is it about this? Why does this one feel different? What is it? Why does the fact that it's direct make a difference? What is it that feels different about it? Why does it matter if you're the one pushing the button or pushing a person? Just go inside yourself and ask, why does it feel so different? So there's a guilt aspect that ties in. So why is it though that we feel more guilty? What is it about pushing this person? So this is a key word, more responsible. So the button is just an object. We are taking the decision. The button, there's a split second for something else to happen, but if you directly kill someone, this is a key point, uh, Luis. They have no choice. And this feels like a really big issue is somehow in this case, you are using this person as an object for some greater goal. This person is not someone, you're not, you're directly acting on a person to cause them to do something for somebody else that they might not agree to. And to show that this is kind of somehow involved, imagine if you see this train coming and you're talking, you, lead, you tap this person on the shoulder and you go, excuse me, sir or madam, or however you choose to identify, there's a train coming and I happen to be stuck here because I terrible super glue accident, I can't move and I can't throw myself in front of this train, but you individual in front of me, um, if you were to be pushed in front of this train, you would stop it. And therefore those five people down there would survive. Would you be willing to let me push you? If you say no, I will not. But if you say yes, 
then you will, I will kill you by pushing you in front of this train. Um, now imagine this person says, you know what? Yes, I agree to this. So you push them. In that case, is that as bad as just pushing them? Or if you ask them first and they say yes, is that somehow better? Again, this is kind of an absurd case. Yeah, it somehow feels better. It somehow feels better because you're treating them. And this is a, a term that I'm going to, uh, basically, it seems like we have this other sense of don't use people nearly as tools. Treat them with respect. So it seems like we've got this second sort of moral guideline here, which is coming up in this case. It seems like we don't just care about the numbers. It also matters to us how we engage with other people and whether we're treating them in a respectful, understanding way. It seems like we have to treat humans the way um, we could do it with the golden rule. It seems like somehow you have to, it's wrong to treat people a way different than how you would want to be treated. Or it's wrong if you don't want to be treated as a tool for someone else's goals, then you shouldn't treat other people that way as well. And so what this is, this notion of, another way of putting this is you have a duty to other people. You have a duty to treat other people a certain way simply because you are people and they are people. And even if there's a greater good, you cannot sacrifice everything for the greater good. So this is the notion of, depending on how much of a good it is, what you have to do changes. So in this case, even if you save more lives, you cannot treat someone merely as a tool to save those lives. Um, so I think if you push the button, you'll feel guilty. It'll inside your heart afflict you for the whole lifetime. I think that's a really good point, Jim, is that in either of these cases, you're going to be emotionally scarred. And it seems like, though, in one case, one of the ways, so let's go back to the button case. It seems like one of the things that you consider in the case of deciding whether to push the button or not um, is you're going to have to ask yourself, am I going to be scarred for my whole life? But I think you can also, what Scott just said, is that you're going to have to take into consideration how you feel if you don't push the button. And I think this goes back to a sort of consequentialist way of thinking. When deciding what to do, you're going to take into account the sorts of consequences of it. In this case, by contrast, it seems like your decision is just a straightforward, don't kill people because that is the you have a duty not to use them for the greater good. You cannot just sacrifice people because you decide to. You need to ask them, treat them with respect, see what their views are on it. This sort of view of you have a duty to other people, this notion of duty is like something that you just have to do no matter the circumstances, no matter the consequences. So like soldiers have certain duties in war. Do not leave your post. Do not abandon your comrades. So the idea here is that we also seem to think that there are these duties we have in every single instance of our everyday life of just, there are certain things you cannot do. You cannot murder someone just so you have more benefit, even if murdering that person. So imagine you're poor and you need to feed your family. And so you kill someone and steal their wallet. It seems like even in this case, if it's causing your family more benefit, you've somehow still done something wrong. So this notion of doing something because you have a duty to or not doing something because you have a duty not to, this type of morality is called D, or this type of thinking is called D on D on ontology. And the, the exact, I'm just putting this down again so you've seen the terms. I'm not going to care if you remember them. But the basic idea here is that we seem to have this second strand in our thinking. And what this second strand does is it pulls us in the opposite direction. If our first strand is saying, always look at the consequences. This one is saying, no, sometimes you have to look before you begin the act, before you even think about the consequences. And you have to look and see how you would go or 
Are you treating people with respect? Are you just using them as tools? If you are, it's wrong. So always make sure that even if you're trying to find the best consequences, take a step back and ensure that you are taking everything into account when you're deciding what to do other than just the consequences. Think about if I do this, am I treating someone with respect? Am I ignoring them? Am I using them as a tool for something else? Am I directly causing them harm? And so what we have here is kind of these two different ways of thinking about morality that all of us seem drawn to. On the one hand, you've got this consequentialist idea of you look at the consequences. On the other hand, you've got this deontology view of don't cause people direct harm. Don't use people as tools for other things. Treat them with respect, even if doing so is going to cause you or even the world a little bit more pain. So does everyone understand how we can take these individual cases and pull out these general principles that we can then use in new situations to try to learn how to decide what to do and how a lot of the time what we're doing is we're having to balance these two considerations. So when Elon Musk is de deciding his self-driving car, he has to decide how to program it to take into account both of these sorts of considerations. He has to decide, is it right to just, you know, it's somehow rude to just, you know, tell your car to drive up on the sidewalk and kill someone who's just minding their business. But on the other hand, if there's five people on the road, is the car telling the car just to plow through those five worse? And this is really what you're, we're going to be doing throughout the semester is taking these considerations of if you're doing something um, wrong, or if you're doing something on the internet and you're treating someone merely as a tool, but it's leading to a better outcome, how do you navigate that situation? And another thing we can find though, is that very often when you're causing more harm to the world, you're also treating people with disrespect. So for instance, if you shoot someone and just take their money, that's causing more pain in the world and also you're treating them as a tool for your own ends. So what you're finding here is that what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a lot of ethical situations in which something is perfectly, or a lot of digital situations, computer situations, in which something is perfectly legal. And yet when we think about it, it seems like we're being simply used as a tool by someone else. And also the downstream effects might be negative. So what I wanted to do this class is just really highlight this notion of deontology and this other notion of consequentialism and talk about how we have these strands in our thinking whenever we come across an ethical moral situation. And what we have to do is how to navigate these different impulses and decide what to do. And it's not going to be easy. But if we do this in a setting, you know, if we talk about this in class, then if you ever find yourself in an actual situation in which these issues are coming up, it will be easier for you to decide what to do than it would have been if you've never encountered a situation like this before. Um, so do people understand the difference here between deontology and consequentialism? Basically, consequentialism is the view that when you're deciding what to do, you look at the consequences and the right thing to do is the one with the better consequences. A de deontology is the act of deciding what to do based on the one that is not going to be breaking your duties to other people. Or the right thing to do is the one that treats people with respect, even if that's going to have some negative consequences. And so when you're doing ethics, what you're really doing is deciding in this particular case, how do these things line up? what would be the right way to, or what would have the better consequences? And also, which of these behaviors would be to treat people with respect and which ones would be to ignore them and use them as a tool in my everyday life? So does all of this make sense to everyone? Just like, just the general views of it. All right, so what I wanna say now is just, let's just think about some of the ethical issues we talked about in cyber technology last class. So some of the issues that come up and just talk about how some of these sorts of principles might be applied and allow you to recognize that a certain action is not necessarily a good one. So let's talk about this. Where is it? 
Here's an ethical issue we'll be talking about more, a, well, a little bit more, but we won't be discussing it too, too much in class. Catfishing. What is catfishing? The internet sense of catfishing. Pretending to be someone else online. Yeah. Be, uh, catfishing is pretending to be someone else online. Now, is catfishing right or wrong, or is it somewhere in a gray area? Generally speaking, we all think that catfishing is generally speaking wrong. Now, why is it wrong? Well, we can now take these sorts of principles that we just used and give an explanation for why catfishing is wrong. So let's start with consequentialism. What did we say consequentialism is? It defines the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do in terms of uh, the consequences. So why is catfishing wrong? What is it about catfishing that makes it wrong? What are the consequences of catfishing? Yeah, you're playing with people's emotions. You are causing someone to believe things that they might not otherwise feel. You can cause someone to fall in love with someone who doesn't exist. You can cause someone, if you catfish successfully and you convince them of something, you can make them really look like a complete ass. Um, the people can get involved and find out they're not who they say they are. So do people remember the, um, do people remember this, the Manti Teo scandal from about a decade ago at this point. Have people heard of this man and this situation? So um, is there anyone who has heard of him? Okay, so this was one of the most famous catfishing cases. So Manti Teo is, I don't know if he's still in the NFL, but he is um, an NFL linebacker. At the time, he was at the University of Notre Dame. And at Notre Dame, was uh, voted like defensive player of the year, was a first round draft pick in the NFL. And he made it all over the national news because he was talking about his, basically what happened was there were all these ESPN stories. And what the ESPN stories were saying is that his girlfriend was dying of cancer. And he, before every game would dedicate, like give a speech and dedicate the game to her. And he, he, all these stories about how devoted he was. And before game nights, he would stay up on the phone with her as she got her chemotherapy treatment. And he would make sure. And then late in the season, she died. And she died of the cancer. And he shared this story. And he did, dedicated his entire season to her. And these were like front page ESPN, ESPN news stories all over the place. He was interviewed about it in like the Rose Bowl, all these huge things. It was a huge news story. Based on what we're talking about, can anyone guess what the twist is? What's the twist about Monte Teo? She, it's not that she never died. She never existed. The girlfriend was a fake person created by some guy who he was a friend of a friend who thought it was funny. He genuinely thought he had a girlfriend. He genuinely thought this girlfriend died. The girlfriend never existed. And it was a bunch of fake photos. And it was just an online relationship in which this person got somebody else to like basically FaceTime with him pretending to be someone she wasn't. And he, he basically was in this relationship with someone who didn't exist and who didn't die of cancer. This ruined the man's life. He was a laughing stock. He was like, think about the emotional trauma that this person went through from this catfishing incident. Yeah, it was one of the most screwed up stories and it like made major national news because this poor guy dedicated, he made his entire, he devoted his entire life to a fake dead girlfriend. This is one of the things. So a deontologist or a consequentialist is going to say, this is what happens with catfishing. It causes this much pain. Now, what's a deontologist going to say? Yeah, it, it was so mean and so screwed up. Um, 
A deontologist, why is it wrong to catfish? Remember, a deontologist says that you have a duty to treat people with respect, a duty to treat people how you would want to be treated, a duty to not use people simply as tools for your own benefit. So what is a deontologist going to say? Why is catfishing wrong? Rogelio, I'm really glad you brought up that point. I'm going to bring that up. I'm going to respond to that in a second. That's a great point to bring up. But why is it, what is a deontologist going to say? Why is it wrong to catfish? Well, is catfishing, is tricking someone for your own entertainment or for monetary gain, is that respectful? Is that something that you would want to have happen to you? No, you're using someone as a tool for your own entertainment. So exactly, this deontology is going to say that catfishing is also wrong for the exact same reason. So catfishing in general, if you're a consequentialist, it's wrong. If you're a deontologist, it's wrong. Now, uh, Rogelio brings up a very good uh, point here, which is what about particular cases of catfishing that might not seem bad? So what is a situation in which it might be okay to catfish? Well, think about this case. Um, an undercover cop who's attempting to find somebody who's like, say, a, uh, to put it bluntly, a child rapist, somebody who is sexually abusing children or someone who's sexually abusing people who are like 10 years old. So what might a cop do to try to trap this person? If they know that this person typically connects with people online, the cop might pretend to be a 10 year old person and set up a meeting with this adult. And then when the person shows up, arrest them. And in this case, does it seem like, yeah, or create a, yeah, create a fake profile. In this case of catfishing, does it seem better? Does it seem in this particular case a bit more acceptable? Yes, and why? Why would we say that's the case? Well, we can give a really nice consequentialist answer. Like, yes, this person, we might be tricking someone. We might be treating them disrespectfully, but we are stopping a child rapist from being able to rape any more children. The general grand scheme of things in the world is better. And for a deontologist, you could say something like, yes, maybe we're treating this like this one person with disrespect. But we're treating all of these other people if we aren't solving this, we're treating all the children in the world, we're not giving them the respect they deserve because we are allowing them to be um, sexually uh, assaulted by this person. So in this case, we can also give an explanation of why there are some catfishing cases in which it looks like the right thing to do is to allow catfishing in this case. So what I just wanted to do here is show like, this is the way in which throughout the semester, we're gonna be looking at other more complicated issues and kind of dissecting. All right, what would we say if we're a consequentialist? Does that seem right? What would we say if we're a deontologist? Would that seem right? How should we decide whether Google should be allowed to have all of your data? What's good about that? What's bad about that? And so this was really just like a first step in what we're going to be doing for the whole semester, learning how to go about answering moral questions, taking things we've considered from other situations. And now we're just going to look for the rest of the semester at what some of the big deal issues that are coming up with cyber technology are. And then we're going to be applying these tools we've used in this first real substantive class to those cases. So for instance, next class, we're going to be discussing um, professional ethics, basically how to behave in a workplace environment. And we're gonna be discussing how we decide what sorts of things are acceptable to ask of a worker, how you should behave, what sorts of loyalty you should show an employer, when you should go behind their back, how much responsibility a programmer has to take if something goes wrong with their program. So that's what we're gonna discuss next class. This is more or less everything I wanted to cover this class. Does anyone have any last questions on any of this stuff? Deontology, what morality is, consequentialism, anything. All right. If no one has any questions, I'm going to stop the recording.
Um, and in that case, I'm just going to say that was everything I wanted to cover today. So we finished in pretty good time. I will now just say have a great weekend and we will reconnect next week. Next week will be one of the um, longer classes. So expect to be here until at least one. But this covered everything we wanted to. Um, so yeah, have a good weekend, everybody. And I will see you all next week.